This week, we're on the second episode of Chad Nowak, aka the Final Glide Oz series, in what has become the season of the history of FPV. And honestly, it has been my favorite so far. Uh, Today, we're talking about a lot of the differences between flying back then and flying now. It does, of course, interact with the technical limitations of the aircraft then versus now. I think what's interesting is that Chad is the winner of what was effectively the first world championship. It was called First Nationals at the time. It was in, I believe, in Arizona. And his his reason for the reason that he won is that his drone was a little bit more reliable. Uh, It actually was very interesting to hear that it had almost nothing to do with piloting skill. You just kind of needed to point it and be able to get through a gate. Uh, But the technical limitations of all of the gear back then from the control link on your radio, uh, especially your FPV feed, and even things like your props, whether or not the props decided to, uh, you know, agree with you that day all played a huge role in his ability to finish. And because he finished, uh, he was able to finish first. Uh, so it's, it's really interesting listening to a lot of this yeah, history. Um, so stay tuned. I hope that you enjoy this. If you like what I do, uh, subscribe to my channel. Give me a like on this video. It does help. If you really like what I do, then uh, join my Patreon. Uh, My Patreon, members of my Patreon get uh, an early access, a whole interview to all these. And since I'm putting these out a lot slower now, that means that you may get access to an interview more than a month in advance. Uh, I will tell you that I'm currently scheduling with Bruce Simpson, aka XJet. Uh, it is always a blast to talk to him. And uh, it might be possible that there is a little extra in this one and perhaps a live stream. We'll see. Uh, Anyways, I hope that you enjoy this, and I look forward to seeing you on the flip side. Um, the thing that the thing that I keep coming back to is, you know, I look at my flying now, and you know, I like you know, you talk about Capper was the one that that warehouse was what got you into to FPV, and you you were that for me with the uh, Hawaii, Hawaii balls video. And I look, I, like I periodically will go back and look at your old videos and, and old videos from, you know, just a lot of different pilots. And, you know, the flying doesn't seem, the flying's good, right? But by modern standards, it's just good. I think the thing that a lot of people miss is like how difficult it was to fly. So yeah. that was, was fun. <laughs> yeah. Hold on, what's that? The, the, I think the, the, the best way that people kind of would fully understand it is um, modern day race cars and then go and get, say, like a 1940s race car. Yeah. Um, that's the sort of the difference. Uh, and uh, like a 1940s race car, you were always on the edge of being thrown into the, into the, into the barrier, into the sand trap. Or in 19, they didn't have sand traps. They just had a, a house wall. Yeah. Uh, and similar kind of thing with this. Uh, you just, it was, the difference is completely night and day between the two of them. And that's the thing. As I've always said, there was always pilots um, like, like, oh, you're world champion or you, you've been world champion on sort of stuff. Well, actually, okay, no, I, I always look at it and go, I, I did well on that situation at that point in time. But it was also, it, it in that day, and similar to 3D helicopters, when you look, when you talk to some of the, the original 3D helicopter uh, uh, world champions, where they say, in in that day and age, you had to be both a good pilot and a good tuner and a good builder, yeah. uh, and you need to combine that. And there's a lot of pilots out there today which are brilliant pilots but would never be able to build a quad or tune a quad back in the day with the, the tools that were available. So with the more modern-day technology has basically just opened up the uh, the number of potential people that could do well to a larger pool. That's all it's done. Uh, and that's why they, yeah, I won the World Championships and people going, oh, you know, and, um, 
you're going to go on. How many years are you going to win this? And I sort of said, no, techno, like you see the kids coming through and got hope and help. That's just not going to happen. Um, plus it wasn't, it wasn't my main sort of drive to want to keep on winning this sort of stuff. But, um, but yeah, it's very easy to see. Once the technology came through, it was easier to, um, to fly. That opened up the pool for other people that weren't necessarily technically minded but had the ability to, um, to fly really well. Uh, you see, there's a lot of young kids out there where the, their father puts the quad together and they just go and fly it. There's nothing yeah. wrong with that. There's also, uh, and, there's also a few fathers out there where the kid puts the quad together and the father goes yeah, fly. Yeah, but yeah. I don't know who those would be. <laughs> <laughs> so, you know, back in, <clears throat> what is your take on the pilot back then? Like, it, it sounds like, like, you know, we look at, like, the, the folks from your time are, you know, obviously there there were the four greats, you, Steel, Charpu, and Tommy, right? Like, that's who everybody kind of, of my generation in FPV grew up with, right? You guys were on Rotor Riot, you guys were the best. Um, but the other thing that I've noticed is that, like, three of the four of you, and, and I don't know enough about Charpu to be able to, to speak to it, um, you guys all designed as well. And it wasn't like you just, you know, slapped your name on something. Um, you guys, like, des you designed frames, and, you know, Steel has done motors, and Tommy has done motors, and, and, and frames, and I think you've probably done motors. You did do motors. Um Done frames, done motors, done propellers. Um, uh, I forget that. <laughs> yeah, but yeah, uh, that's because we all sort of come from an era where you had to be that kind of mind type of person because there was nothing available, so you had to adapt stuff. So mm -hmm. you had to you had to be willing to fiddle with stuff and modify stuff and like things like. Back in the uh, the day, where where props weren't available, so we were using the SC six by four point five prop cut down to a five inch prop. Right. So yeah. I made a special tool, and I remember a couple of years ago I found it in the back and I, um, I threw it out. It was like a it was a, an adjustable thing where I could adjust where I could cut up to a ten inch prop down to a five inch prop. So I could I had the size there and had a Dremel tool on there where an old motor mm -hmm. bell where I could spin it around, cut it on sort of stuff. You did, you had to be um, good at fiddling and and uh, and knowing how to modify stuff. Um, uh, so I think that's where a lot of that comes from because we came from that era where there was just there was nothing available that actually worked. You could get something that was from something else. Mm -hmm. um, it's kind of like uh, uh, the maker space type of people. Yeah. Like um, uh, there's nothing available, so you make it. I, you know, it's interesting. Your your point on you know you guys had to be very holistic in your approach, and that 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 now, um, you know the the uh, well here here's the thing, the piloting skills are far more important now. But I wonder if some of the best pilots that have come up in the past few years would be flying at all because maybe they don't have the technical skills to begin. I mean, I know for my first build, it took me like three months, <laughs> right? Like, and, and there were online tutorials and things like that. I, so. I, I reckon most of them wouldn't be where they were if they had um, uh, what was available back then. Yeah. Uh, and like I said, that's the whole reason why I think that certain people did well because you needed a, a multitude of skills to be able to succeed mm -hmm. um, where you need less number of skills uh, and well, the, the balance has very much shifted uh, where it used to be 30% um, build, a 30% tune, a 30% uh, pilot. Now it's like 20% um, builder um 10% um, or 5% tuner yeah. uh, and the rest is pilot. Uh, so the emphasis has gone more on pilot, which is a good thing because it allows more people to get into it and, and enjoy it. Um, yeah. And, yeah, I, I could say, well, I really enjoyed the the technical or the engineering skill just as much as the flying, which I did because I'm sort of technically minded. But, I mean, that's, there's no right or wrong in that. I mean, if you just enjoy flying, then um, – 
more power to you and uh, and it brings more th those people that enjoy that allows them to get into that so mm -hmm. it's opened that up and if you enjoy tinkering hey there's always something new to work on and try and make better and so forth so that avenue is always available there um let's let's kind of pivot a little bit because you you were the first was it world nationals champion for racing yeah technically nationals they call them the unofficial world i don't the know I, world. I, I just say world champion because i can that'll do i don't really care but <laughs> yeah well the good yeah. thing is nobody's I've, gonna got a, I've got a buckle proof me wrong <laughs> <laughs> um <clears throat> racing back then was very different than it is now it talk was to surviving me back then <laughs> talk to me talk to me about like what did it actually take to be the world champion versus what it takes now um, so having aircraft that would actually make it, so <laughs> it's a, it's a simple one. It really is like, um, yeah, these days you've got to have an aircraft that doesn't, you don't want to crash your aircraft and hurt your aircraft right. once of stuff, mm -hmm. but the reliability just wasn't there. These things were right on the edge. Uh, they weren't as durable. Uh, they weren't as flyable. Um, so having an aircraft that could actually make it and having a reliable setup was so much more of a key because they just weren't reliable. Mm -hmm. um, and I'll be honest, luck was a bigger factor because of things like your FPV signal was shit most of the time, mm -hmm. um, depending on where you were. And, I mean, yeah, it's still a case even today, yeah. but you take away a lot of the modern-day transmitters and receivers in particular Mm -hmm. that um, stop you from seeing other people's uh, uh, views, stop the static, uh, stop the complete blackouts and that sort of mm -hmm. stuff. Um, it was, yeah, just getting a clean run where you could see. Like I remember um, getting so frustrated during the, um, uh, during the, uh, the, uh, uh, the heats and so forth of just getting uh, times around the track at that, at Sacramento, just going, if only I could get a like a full lap where I could actually see where I was going for the full lap, I could actually um, I could actually do a good lap. Yeah. And I remember you pissing off because I remember I think Steele got like the fastest lap in the um, uh -huh. in the in there. And um, and I was like, I can go so much faster than that. I know I can. <laughs> I just like and it was just pissing me off because it's not like sort of like oh well you just didn't do good enough i just i never got a full lap being able to see things and it was only i got uh, a little bit of luck when i actually started racing it still wasn't perfect i could actually see where i was going and you, if you people remember the races when the like the <laughs> there was like the finals like mark was saying hey you're, you're um um, you've done a really good lap. You're in the lead. You can slow down. I'm like, now nah, fuck off. I want 18 seconds a lap. I, I don't give a shit if I crash right. out. I'm pissed. Mm -hmm. I want. I want. That's what I want. Mm -hmm. um, so yeah, um, the 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 biggest thing was reliability and having quads that actually worked reliably. I think was the the hardest part. Uh, and then having a setup that you felt um, confident with. Once mm -hmm. again these things were not flying very uh, solidly at all. Uh, and they were very, very susceptible to small changes. So you you bang your aircraft a little bit. Mm. It changes the aircraft and it gets a resonant frequency that just fucking goes everywhere and all of a sudden the aircraft mm. vibrating and not flying well. And one day it'll fly great, one day it'll fly crap. Yeah, that happens today but not to the level that it did back then. Like today, if it's, if it's doing that, you just detune it a little bit mm -hmm. uh, and you're okay. Back then you detuned a little bit. Now you couldn't hold a fucking hover. Yeah. <laughs> so did, yeah, it was right on the edge. Um, it's you know, speaking to the converse of that, right? And, and you know, you and, and Tommy and even Bob Ruge, y'all talk about how, hey man, you, you, you clip a tiny, tiny, you know, twig, or you hit a blade of grass. And if the drone, if the prop doesn't explode, it's still almost completely useless at that point. And um, I, uh, I was uh, speaking to recently, there's a, there's a friend of mine. He he's actually, he's like in his eighties and he started flying FPV um, guy named Justin Farnsworth. 
And he, he it, it, conversing with him is fantastic because he's got that old school conversational style. And so we, we end, end up effectively writing letters back and forth, but we send them over email. There's, there's actually a subtle mm. difference to that. Um, but he, he emailed me one day he's, and he goes, hey, uh, he tells me this story where he, he's got this giant farm. And so he flies all over the farm. And he said, well, I went down. And I was able to turtle mode out of it. And he said, I noticed it was flying a little funny uh, when it was on its way back. And there was a little bit of jitter to the flight. He's like, and I hadn't re really ever seen that before. And then I noticed that my voltage was just plummeting. Like something was wrong. <laughs> he said, so he finally landed it, you know, a good couple hundred yards from him and decided to walk to it. And what had happened was he had, th the prop had not exploded, but he had lost one blade and the other two were chopped down. <laughs> and he, he turtle voted, picked it up and flew it back. And the motor was so hot that it had scorched the grass around it and the metal had started to delaminate. <laughs> <laughs> he was in, he, he was like, I didn't even know this was possible. <laughs> you know, it's, it's like, it says something for the windings, like whatever, uh, oh. like keep using those windings. Yeah. <laughs> I, and I, I don't remember what the motor was, but, but yeah, he, he was like, this is insane. Like, how did this thing stay in the air? Yeah. Um, whereas, you know, the yeah. converse, when, when y'all started, it was like, oh, well, it looked at a blade of grass funny and the prop is now useless and the drone is on the ground and maybe somewhere I can't find it. It, it wasn't an uncommon thing for props just to basically lose a prop blade for no reason at all because these things just, they didn't like being abused. They're like, well, mm -hmm. I've had 10 flights on that. Boom, off it goes. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, yeah they're, they're just, they wouldn't, so that they, these days we've got these durable props or these durable materials. Before that you had glass nylon, which was semi-durable but would snap. We're talking about nylon without any glass reinforcement in it as well. So not only was it not durable, but it was also flexible. Um, and that's, yeah, that's sort of like back in the, the gem, the early gem fan and FC prop days. That's what they were. And I remember I was spending um, before um, – HQ prop came out. No, this is actually during HQ prop when they when they had the mm -hmm. uh, after they started making the first cut down uh, props. I was spending about two hundred and fifty bucks a month just on props. Wow! And I always laugh when people sort of talk about the oh, yeah. these props are expensive. Like like they're cheap compared to what they were, and yeah. these ones actually last. Like you can get through a full session with just a set of props. Mm -hmm. I, I, and I'm like. That didn't happen. Like I was carrying like the backpacks we used to carry. That was for the props. <laughs> um, so not so besides props and I mean obviously flight controllers and uh, ESCs. How did batteries change? Um, batteries. Uh, they they would handle um, handle abuse a little bit better. Back, um, back in the day or now? Uh, now these days, uh, these days they'll handle abuse a little bit better. Um, and I wouldn't say that the technology necessarily moved along a lot. Um, yes, it has moved on a bit, but um, all the, the hype lovers would say that, that, oh, yes, we've we've got all these wonderful graphene badges. No, li the lithium polymer technology that we use actually hasn't really progressed much. It's more a case of it became a bigger market and we got better quality batteries. That was probably the biggest difference there. And we got um, a bigger choice. Mm -hmm. So when you've got better quality and a bigger choice, you end up getting slightly better batteries there. So battery technology, I would say, really has was probably the, the area that hasn't progressed, uh, has progressed the least uh, out of a lot of them. I mean, when we talk about the actual battery specifications, of course, yeah, started off 2S, I think it was 2S1000 or something along the lines of that. Then we went to uh, 3S1300. Um, I was sort of one of the first people to successfully start doing 4S, uh, and 4S people were like, you're nuts. Like, that's yeah. just stupid. Why would you ever want that kind of power? 
um, and it's just going to blow shit up. Uh, and mm -hmm. the biggest problem we had back in the day with 4S was we didn't have ESCs that could handle um, the uh, the, um, the amperage. The re the, no, it wasn't so much the amperage; it was the refresh rate. We're having desync mm. problems. Okay. So it it came to things like feel with the Kiss ESCs to be able to handle 4S because that was such a high refresh rate uh, and high frequency that the 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 uh, Blue Series ESCs they would just they would desync and blow a FET and, and blow motors and shit. Yeah. Um, so yeah, going to 4S um, was sort of like the the big big change. And then, of course, more recently, going to the success so people going to success. Did you ever? And, uh, did you ever fly success? Yeah, I've flown. I've flown success. Um, yeah, it's it's more of the same. Yeah, I mean, it's longer flight times. Um, people sort of talk about all oh, this extra torque and all that sort of stuff, and I'm yeah. just going, yeah, I, I'm not saying that there's not, but. Um, it's it's amazing, like how much quicker a quad goes when you paint it red and give it to someone. <laughs> oh, I'm so much faster. I mean, the biggest yeah. thing really that that success brought was the efficiency. So um, a mm -hmm. little bit longer flight time. But I, I do find the whole interesting thing, like you watch all these these people that were really pushing success that were mm -hmm. the big name ones, mm -hmm. that also had their names on battery packs and shit like that. Mm -hmm. So they were making money out of it, and they got to. Is it because it's better or because you're making money off it? I'm not sure which one it is. Um, so, yeah, there was efficiencies there. But when you uh, compared apples to apples, so mm -hmm. the same uh, um, same amount of energy um, in the battery uh, with the different voltages, there was a small difference, small mm -hmm. improvement. Um, mm -hmm. The big improvement with the 6S batteries is that we actually went up in total energy. So mm -hmm. I think we use, I think it's 1100s of the, uh, are the common ones these days. There's actually more energy in that than a 4S 1300. Mm -hmm. And that's why you fly longer, which I always laugh at because back in the 1300 4S days, if you added three grams to your quad, people were losing their shit because, um, uh, because um, like it now off. it's, it's going to fly crap. Uh, yeah. <laughs> um, but now it's okay with success, which I, I find yeah. a little bit uh, comical, but hey, that's FPV pilots for you. So yeah, yeah. I, as far as the actual technology, not a huge deep change in batteries, but yeah, going from different voltages and having a bigger pool of types of batteries to choose from. So getting better quality batteries. Thus ends the second episode of Chad Nowak, a.k.a. Final Glide Oz's History of FPV. In the next episode, we talk about the differences in the community back then versus now. And I had asked if the uh, disagreements were more heated. He said, no, actually, they weren't. But it was a much smaller community. Everybody knew each other. And so there was a more personal aspect in the disagreements in the sense of they were able to reconcile far easier. And it wasn't as personal. Whereas nowadays on things like Facebook, uh, it becomes, it can quickly become a personal attack. Anyways, I hope that you guys will stay tuned for the next one. Uh, also, if you like what I do, hit like, subscribe. Uh, and if you really like what I do, check out my Patreon. They get early access to all interviews uh, as well as a podcast. And they may actually get early access to the next uh, interview, which is with Bruce Simpson, a.k.a. x -Jad. I hope that you all have a great and a fantastic day. And I will talk to you later.